Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Blue Maxima. Welcome back to Blue Boards. This time we're taking a look at Crossfire, a game by Emerson Matsuchi, played had games, and apparently set in the world of Spectre Ops, but that matters absolutely not at all to this game. So we're just going to completely ignore that entirely. One thing I want to praise the game for right off the bat though is the size of the box. It's actually pretty small, that's my hand right there. So it's genuinely just enough in order to store the components, the rule book, and still be small enough to be relatively easy to travel with without being much of a problem at all or spending more materials than you need to. Looking at you, Baseball Highlights 2045. Looking at you, Guardians, where your boxes are so bloody big that you could fit in boxes half the size and not have a problem. So, Crossfire is a social deduction game, a la Blood on the Clock Tower, Mafia, Werewolf, you get the general idea. But it does a few things that I actually really enjoy over the case of something like Blood on the Clock Tower or Mafia or Werewolf. So, let's just take a quick look at the roles and see what we've got here. We've got the VIP, who is the central pillar of the game. They need to survive for the blue team to win, they need to die for the red team to win. The blue team and the red team are comprised of agents and assassins who have guns. And the agents and the assassins will be able to point at each other with their guns when the round is over to try and shoot either each other or the VIP. You've also got decoys and the amount can vary depending on the amount of people you've got in the game and they can vary on their objectives depending on whether or not they're a blue decoy or a red decoy and or just a regular decoy like uh, this one down here and you've also got a bystander who just wins if they're not shot so they need to try and convince people not to shoot them pretty simple right and there's some agents and some assassins in order to make for higher player count games with that said let's put these cards down for now and we will set up a six player game which consists of a VIP, an agent and a blue decoy for the blue team, the red team is two assassins, and a bystander just off to the side trying not to get shot. We give this deck a quick shuffle and then we will deal it out one card each to the six players that are sitting in the circle. I don't have much camera room here so I think you'll understand if I just keep it like this. So our dealer is right here and our extra player that we need to worry about is over here and you'll understand what I mean in a little bit because I need to demonstrate how this shuffling tactic works so you can understand why I like the mechanic that goes with it so much. So we'll say we're playing as the dealer and we know that we are an agent. Okay, fair enough. Now that we've looked at our roll card and everyone else has looked at theirs, we shift every card to the left and then we have an opportunity to look at this new card, which is an assassin. Okay, so we know for a fact that we have an agent on our left. That is a really good thing to know if we're an assassin. So now, we flip that back face down, and the dealer will take their cards and shuffle them with their exact neighbors, place them back out again, and take a look at what he found. So he's the agent again. So now this agent knows something as well, and every third player to the left of the dealer will also shuffle the cards. It might sound a little bit confusing, but thankfully the manual has a very helpful diagram that tells you exactly how you're meant to shuffle the cards in question. This agent here now has a bunch of info. He knows that he's an agent. He knows that there is an assassin somewhere next to him. So he knows for a fact that there's an assassin somewhere and he needs to figure out which one of his neighbors that it is. So let's just reveal this half of the, uh, the circle here. So, oh god, he's got both assassins on his side now. Now that's a problem. So he's learned a little bit about the circle. Technically this would all still be face down. So he knows there's an assassin next to him. And now people need to start communicating. They've all had this same amount of knowledge parted to them. Some people get less information than others. For example, this guy here would have seen his initial role get passed over onto this side of the circle. But this is also good information for the guy who's sitting here. Because he knows that something has ended up on this other half of the circle. Not to mention he knows what he is. And he's also potentially seen either the second assassin, and the assassins actually have unique artwork, so if you can remember what the assassins look like, you might realize there's a second assassin in your circle, or he might have seen the agent, so he knows that one of his neighbors is going to be bad for him, and he's going to have to try and either kill him, or focus on keeping his attention away so that he can look for the VIP. So everybody in this circle has gotten a good amount of information, and that's one of the really genius things I like about Crossfire, 
because it gives you a lot of information and a lot to start working with without needing a game master or information roles in order to provide you all the stuff that you need. It's just everyone knows who they are to the point where their objectives are really, really simply written on there. So even if they tend to forget who they are or who they've got next to them, they at least know their objective is find the VIP and then protect them. And then you just all have to turn to each other and start talking about it. And it's so simple. There's only six cards in the circle, and if you get like a really lucky deal of information, you might find out what every role on your side of the circle is in a six player game, so you know exactly everyone who's in the top three up there. What could possibly make this any harder? How about a three minute timer? So everyone's got a bit of, a bit of information, and everyone needs to share it as quickly as possible, because those three minutes will go away fast. Thankfully, the game's got a couple of really unique built-in things going on, like, for example, the backs of the cards here. I'm und undeclared. I'm not going to say that I'm anybody. I'm an agent. Or, I'm a bystander. Please don't shoot me. So as a result, it keeps things interesting. Because, of course, you've got... All the reason in the world to tell the truth. Like, I'm an agent, I need to find the VIP. But then, of course, the VIP has a reason not to come out with it, because they might be thinking, Oh dear, I might be surrounded by assassins. I need to keep this to myself. The bystander is going to want to keep lying about everything as much as humanly possible. They're going to want to be something that doesn't want to be shot. Then again, that people might think they're the VIP. So, you've got all of those different little things going on in a social deduction game. And you do have all of this hidden information, but admittedly, it's not much. You do have a limited amount of roles and where they can be, and everybody has a piece of that puzzle. But thanks to that time limit, it works, because you don't have enough time to properly logic out this entire circle, even if you've got a lot of information working for you. So, you have the opportunity to make mistakes, you have the opportunity to miss something, and of course, an evil player can take advantage of that right away and try and send you down the wrong path. So it works perfectly in that regard. So at the end of the three minutes, everyone will have to be pointing their fingers at somebody, basically representing a gun. Then the dealer will say, uh, people who are unarmed, put your guns down. Agents, reveal your roles. Have you shot anyone? Have you shot the VIP? If you have, you lose. If you've shot a bystander, you lose individually. If you've shot an assassin, great. Okay, assassins, if you haven't been shot, point at people who you've been pointing at this entire time and tell them to reveal their roles. If you've shot the VIP, you've won. If you haven't, you lose. And so as a result, it just keeps that social dynamic going. It creates all of those sorts of puzzles that you get from social deduction games. It has a bunch of interesting roles while at the same time, not being so generic as to be boring, and it just gives you that really solid social deduction experience in about three minutes. It, it's genuinely, that's how short it is. It even says on the back of the box, duration three minutes. With initial setup, it comes out to be around five or six, depending on how fast or slow you are. And one of the best things about it, if you don't want to change anything about the layout of the players, you just pick up the six cards, shuffle them, and you've got another game ready to go. It's really clever. And for a game as small as it is, it does a really good job at being a really nice social deduction game. And it doesn't have things like Blood on the Clock Tower's luck or potential bad plays causing you to lose two and a half to three hours of your time because someone was being an ass. It's all over in three minutes. It's very hard to complain. We haven't even gone into the special roles yet. So at the bottom of the deck that I didn't show you initially, we have the special roles. And these are usually added into the game via removing a bystander or an agent or a assassin or something along those lines. It says in the book what you need to remove and what you don't. So in this case, We've got the supporter and the protester. They're basically bystanders, but they need to convince people not to shoot the VIP or to shoot the VIP while not getting themselves shot. So they're basically more complicated bystanders, which makes things a little bit more interesting for the people who pick them up. You've then also got the enforcer, who instead of firing one gun, he fires two guns. So it makes the game a lot harder for that poor bastard who picked up the enforcer. You've got the bodyguard, who protects people. So if he finds the VIP and manages to protect them from one shot and only one assassin took aim at them, that's it. It's over. 
But of course, that means you need to be paying attention to different parts of the circle or different people's uh, social things. The Peacekeeper. You win if no bystanders are shot. So if you've got like three different bystanders in there, that's a problem. But he's also got the protection ability and not just like actually shooting people. And then you've got the final special role, which is... <laughs> Let's just say, I imagine you can guess what people were yelling in the middle of the crowded board game shop whenever someone came up with this. The Bomber. If you are not shot, you win and everyone else loses. Actually really good fun because it flips the game on its head. Instead of the red and the blue teams needing to worry about just shooting each other, they need to find and shoot this guy as well. And that makes it genuinely concerning half the time. And you can shuffle in a lot of different roles as many ways as you want as long as you've got the bystanders or the agents or the assassins to take out in order to fit them in. Just to give you an example, here's what a 10 player game would look like. You probably also saw it in the video's thumbnail. But then you've got one last special role. And that's the Sniper. The Sniper is actually completely different because there is a secondary game mode called the Sniper Mode. Where one player gets the Sniper and up to three sniper shots. It depends on how many assassins there are in the game. And everybody else does the shuffling, the talking, and the pointing guns at the end. But the sniper also has to pick who to hand their shots out to. And they can do that at any time throughout the game and shift their shots at any time throughout the game. But of course, as soon as the game ends, the sniper takes their shots. And if they manage to kill all the assassins, they've won. If they haven't though, it moves on to the assassins. The agents aren't actually able to shoot in the sniper mode. So even if you have two agents in there taking shots at people, it just makes it a bit rough for them. They basically just turn into decoys, but to be fair, that's not a bad thing for them as long as they can get into the firing line. But yes, after the sniper takes their three shots, any living assassins will take their shots. And if those assassins manage to hit the VIP, well that's it, the red team wins. Otherwise the blue team wins. And the nice thing about the sniper mode is that it can give someone the opportunity to just sit out there and just relax and just figure out stuff on their own while everyone else is talking. So if, they're, if you're a little worried about them not being able to remember things or something along those lines, or you just want to let them just sit outside the circle and take a break, well, you can play a good game of sniper. And even then, there's actually a secondary benefit that we didn't expect, but it actually turned out pretty well. One of my local board gaming group is blind. Uh, he's also got something else, but I'd be lying if I said I knew what it was. I might have been told to me months ago, but I don't remember. But yeah, he's blind basically, so there's a lot of games he can't play. Because the sniper doesn't have to rely on seeing what's on these cards, only knowing the roles and what they're supposed to be doing, he was actually able to play the sniper for a few rounds. I never actually got whether or not he enjoyed it, but it was still a nice thing to have just at the end of the day. and. If you're looking for just a little bit of variation on the way that the, the normal game works, there you go. It's a nice little extra mode and it doesn't take that up that much room in the way of cards. So yeah, Crossfire. It's a three minute social deduction game, but it manages to maintain those puzzles of where people are in the circle. It manages to maintain giving out uh, pieces of information to people while not relying on a specific game master just by paying attention to the way that the circle is shuffled. It's got a fair few roles so that the game never gets particularly boring unless you're playing it like 30 times in one go. And it's so quick that it's really easy to just pick it up, shuffle it and start again. Start another three minute timer and give it another go. And it just, it provides that social deduction experience that everyone's sh shouting across the table. I know there's an assassin over there. Why are none of you admitting to it? Oh, I saw an assassin go over to your side. I know damn well that there's an assassin there. Yada, 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 yada. You get the picture. It gives you that experience in a really small box with a cool time limit and a cool way to spread information around without having to rely on a game master. It's really well done. I I've got to tell you, man, Emerson Mitsuchi can do no wrong. Spectre Ops, Vault, and now this? Just makes me even madder that he never got to make that Metal Gear Solid game. With that said, this has been Blue Maxima. I'll see you all next time.